Well, good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. We are going to jump right into our study, um, going through the book of Matthew, but titling it Encouraging Faith. Um, we've been going through the Beatitudes. We kind of got to the end of them last week, Blessed Are the Persecuted. Let me just kind of summarize that a little bit as we move on, because the Beatitudes isn't the end of Jesus' message. He starts a message we have recorded in Matthew chapter 5. It goes through 5, 6, and 7. It's one big sermon. My kind of guy. <laughs> Took all afternoon. Again, my kind of guy. <laughs> the Beatitudes are the first words that Jesus speaks as he goes back into the region of Galilee, having been through the baptism with John and then his testing in the wilderness. And we've been talking about this, the fact that Jesus is the representation of the kingdom of light, and he's entering into the kingdom of darkness. There's a clash of two kingdoms. A thought that I heard this morning is that Jesus only needed his word to cast out demons, to heal the sick. And his word is so powerful that all he has to do is go into the kingdom of darkness and begin to speak. And destroys and dismantles the lies of that kingdom. In the same way, the word of God tells us that the word of God is our weapon of warfare against principalities and powers. That all we have to do is abide in that word and speak that word and something is happening in the spiritual realm. When we speak the word of God into a situation, when we begin to speak the word of God into someone's life, there's a war that's going on and the word of God is the most powerful. That's why it doesn't need to be my opinion. It needs to be, what's God's word in this moment? Because that's what's powerful and active in those steps. The Beatitudes are a process, they're steps. I really hate to refer them to that way, but they, that's kind of what they are. But we don't just do step one and then move on and forget step one. It's kind of like we go to elementary school, we learn how to count to 100, we learn how to uh, do the alphabet, and as we go through school, we bring all of that information with us, and we learn to do math uh, homework and equations and all that kind of stuff, and how to function with the numbers, and then we use the letters to create words and sentences and communicate. So all of that information continues to go with us all the time. Anytime we write a check or make a deposit in our checkbook, we are using math that we learned back in first grade, numbers and how they work to do those things. The Beatitudes are the same way. Just because we go through step one, the poor in spirit, doesn't mean that we just leave it behind. The idea that we're poor in spirit needs to be with us every day because it becomes the impetus to ask God for his help. I, I, I never... I can't get to the point where I don't think that I don't need him. That's dangerous territory. So the Beatitudes are, are steps that we process our relationship with God, but then they, we bring them with us for the rest of our life. The word of God must replace the things of the world that are driven out. As we've looked at the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are a mechanism to help us begin to separate ourselves from the world. They're a way in which we begin to cast out the beliefs that the world has taught us and replace them with what God says. Here's the key, though. The Word of God must replace whatever's driven out. Otherwise, some other word is going to fill that void. This is what Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 11. I have it on page one of the notes there. Luke 11, verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding that, he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Now, for many people, that's a great thing. My wife insists that before we ever go on a vacation, the house is clean and everything's put in order. So when we come home, it's all good. But Jesus is trying to make a point here. He's saying, look, when an evil spirit leaves a man and goes out and looks for some place to find, to rest, and can't find any place, he's like, you know what, I'll go back. 
And when he comes back and he finds that void in the man is still there, he says, I'm going to go get some buddies and we're going to come and have a party. And Jesus' point is, is when the spirit of, of evil is driven out, the kingdom of God's got to fill that void. Otherwise, you end up being worse than what you began with. It's very interesting that as he says that, a woman cries out from the crowd and says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. They're hearing words of truth. They're hearing clarity and understanding. And this woman responds to it and says, Blessed is the woman who gave birth to you. You're a fantastic teacher. And Jesus responds and says, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's his point. When the words of the world are removed from our being, the words of God must take its place. Or some other more dastardly word will take the void. And we'll end up believing something much worse than what we believed before. The word of God needs to consume us and take the place of whatever is driven out. The Beatitudes establish a foundation and a framework for continuing a relationship with God. We need to be always seeking Him, always desiring for His ways and, and what it is He wants over our life. As I was thinking about that this week, the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer share a lot in common. The Beatitudes talk about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, pray this way, that in the earth the Father's will and in heaven will be done. That's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I want the righteousness of God to be operating in my life and in the earth. Desiring and hungering for God, it, it, it's seeking his word. So there's a great connectivity between the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer. When we let God's word take place in our lives, an activity of remodeling takes place. Old things are thrown out, new things take their place. As the world is rejected from our lives, something of the kingdom of God takes its place. Understand, folks, that's the blessing. There's tremendous blessing in removing the world and having the kingdom of light take our place. Having Christ form within in us, that's the blessing. Because I have never hated myself for forgiving somebody. I have never loathed myself for being obedient to God. I hate myself and I loathe myself when I know I've been disobedient. There's tremendous blessing to letting the kingdom of God consume me. I don't become proud, but I don't hate myself either. That's a great thing. The transformation that occurs within us is beneficial to our lives. It comes to remake us into the image of God. Now, don't misunderstand, because there's a theology out there that we all become little gods. That's not what I'm saying. In the beginning, God formed man in his image. Because of Adam and Eve's decision and the kingdom of darkness beginning to influence our lives, we have not become vessels of God's image. We've become vessels of the evil kingdom. As, that, as we detach from the world and God's word begins to consume our lives again, we are reformed into the image of God. We become active vessels of his righteousness in the earth again. Not only are we remade in his image, the mission that was given to humanity at the beginning is reestablished as well. To have dominion in the earth, to exercise righteousness in the earth. We expand the kingdom of God in two ways. One, as you and I move closer and closer to God, our lives display greater amounts of his righteousness. And as we go and we proclaim the gospel to other people and they come into the kingdom, 
then they expand the kingdom of God's righteousness as well. That was his plan from the very foundation of the earth. Both of these activities, our expression of righteousness and proclaiming the gospel and other people coming into the kingdom is bearing the fruit of God in our lives. To drive home his point about living transformed lives, Jesus ends the beatitude portion with, Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to measure a man, you measure him by what is he like when he's persecuted. I always told people, if you want to find out what somebody's really like, back him into a corner then you'll find out what's really in the depth of their being. Because people can put on a great facade when everything's good, but do, any, do anything to make them angry, and then you'll find out what's in the depth of that person. Persecution is the place where we learn about ourselves, where the, where the very foundation of our being is revealed. As we spoke last week, blessed are the persecuted, blessed are those who are hated, blessed are those who are rejected, blessed are those who are afflicted, those who are tested, those who are oppressed. All of these things are occurring in the earthly realm. Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we mentioned last week, one of the key points of being transformed is beginning to think about the kingdom of heaven instead of thinking about the kingdom of earth. Being focused on God's righteousness and the spiritual kingdom of, of him than to be concerned about attachments to the world. Think about it this way. John was beheaded. He was only 30 couple years old. Remember, he was six months older than Jesus. He was beheaded. Jesus was stripped, beaten, and crucified. Stephen was stoned. Most of the apostles were martyred in some fashion. And yet out of them poured God. We love the first part of Hebrews 11. We're not big fans of the second part. Listen to it. Hebrews 11.35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Yeah, we like that part. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better, better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and in caves in the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Hebrews 11 is telling us that there are things in the earth that will occur to those who walk with God. We will be persecuted. Jesus made it clear over and over and over. We will be persecuted, we will be hated, we will be rejected. Some of us may suffer extreme things. But if our eyes are fixed on heaven, then those things don't carry the meaning in our lives. Doesn't mean we won't feel pain. But instead of being concerned about the pain my body is feeling, I'm concerned about the one who's doing it to me. Now, as I said last week, the Beatitudes are actually building one upon the other to get us to the very next things Jesus begins to say. You can look at it and say the Beatitudes were simply the opening statements of Jesus to get to things he really wanted to tell us. He goes from blessed are the persecuted to you are the salt of the earth. Now, before we just race over that, 
I want to stop and analyze this. I want to talk about salt. We know what it is. It's white stuff. It tastes salty. <laughs> if something's kind of bland, we just throw some salt on it so it tastes more salty. And often that's just the image that we use in this. Oh, we're supposed to add flavor to the earth. Well, there's some truth to that, but folks, let's understand some things from the scriptures. Salt is used in several different occasions in the scriptures to communicate to us several messages. I want to spend some time looking at them today, because it's actually very fascinating, in light of what Jesus is trying to tell us through the Beatitudes. So, page three of the notes. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. So in part of the law, as they bring their offerings, God states and says, look, whenever you bring a grain offering, when you bring your corn harvest, your wheat harvest, your barley harvest, whatever it is, and you bring the tithe, and you bring a thanksgiving offering to God, the, the Levites are supposed to add salt to that when they offer it to the Lord. And you say, well, why? Notice the language that's being used here. You shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering, with all your offerings, you shall to offer salt. What's he trying to say? He's not saying you have to make it taste better. That's not the point here. The word season has several different meanings. Today marks a season change. We go from winter to spring. Hallelujah. <laughs> season means to change the flavor of, but season is also used in reference to someone who has grown by testing and experience. They're seasoned at their job. We also take things like cast iron and wood and we season it so that we can use it Seasoned wood is wood that's dry. The moisture's gone from it, so now you can build stuff with it and it won't crack when the weather changes. Cast iron, you have to season it so the thing doesn't keep rusting. You make it fit for use. So season has a number of different implications to it. The other thing to keep in mind is every offering that's brought to God is more than just the offering. The offering, whether it's a sin offering, whether it's a uh, thanksgiving offering, whether it's a peace offering, whatever it is, every offering is actually an extension of the heart of the giver. Remember, Jesus sat watching people put their tithe in. And along comes a woman and she throws in two mites and he says, that woman's given more than the rest of these. Why does he say that? Because they simply gave out of their abundance. There was no heart attachment to what they gave. They reached in their pocket, pulled out their change, had no meaning to their heart. But to the woman who threw in two mites, Jesus said, there was a heart attachment there. And she's expressing her heart attitude about God through what she just gave. Every offering, whatever it is, has a great heart attachment about what it says about my relationship with God. God is trying to say something to us about this, and salt is the vehicle that he's doing it with. Let's look at some more. Numbers 18, 8. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, Here I myself have also given you a charge of my heave offerings, and all the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I have given them as a portion to you and to your sons, as an ordinance forever. 
verse 19, all the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with the Lord with you and with your descendants with you. So God keeps throwing out a couple terms. He throws out salt and then he throws out the covenant of salt. And he says there's a connection between the two. When you put salt in with the offerings, you're verifying and, and proclaiming the covenant of salt that God has made with us. I'll explain. Hang on. Let's look at one more. Second Chronicles 13. This is uh, God expressing what he has done for King David. Verse 5. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion of Israel to David forever, to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? God is using this covenant of salt language to express something about his covenant with David, that David would be king, that his family would be king over Israel forever. Now, I put in the notes, we won't read the whole thing, but if you go back to 1 Chronicles, you'll find where this covenant is made. Remember, David is in his house. He's got a beautiful house. He looks out and he sees the tent of God. And in David's heart, he says, here I am living in this house. God's in a tent. I want to build a house for God. And Nathan the prophet comes, and David says, I need to build God a house. And Nathan says, that's a great idea. And then he leaves, and after he leaves, God comes to Nathan and says, no, 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 go back to David, I have a word for him. So Nathan goes back to David and he says to David, I didn't ask for a house. Your son will build me one. But God goes on and says to David, I'm going to build you a house. And your family will sit on the throne forever. Now, I want us to understand something. When God makes this covenant with David about David's family being on the throne forever, he never uses the term covenant of salt. He only speaks of forever and everlasting. In 2 Chronicles, when it's being reminded about what God has done, Solomon uses the language, God made a covenant of salt with David. The point is this, salt and forever are connected. Salt and everlasting are connected. When God refers to the covenant of salt, he's referring to a covenant that perpetuates for eternity. So God has made a covenant with Israel, his people, to be their God forever. But remember, the covenant has two sides, right? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. So what is Israel's part of the covenant? To worship God, to magnify his name, and to obey him forever. Did they fail at that? Yes. But don't miss the point. Adding salt to the offerings is God expressing to the Israelites, keep your heart attitude towards me where the covenant places it, in worship, thanksgiving, and to magnify my name forever. The covenant of salt is speaking to the heart attitude it talks about God's relationship to, to Israel, to the church, of who he will be forever. When God made Abraham the Genesis 15, 1 promise, yes, I've got to throw that in there. God made that promise to be forever. There's no termination date to the Genesis 15, 1 promise. But on the back side of that, on the other side of that, God wants us to respond to him by faith, forever. 
There's no termination date to our faith. So the covenant of salt is talking about a relationship and we're talking about a hard attitude of us towards God that's supposed to be going on day after day after day for as long as I live and then will perpetuate through eternity. Because what are the saints doing in Revelation before the throne? Worshiping God and magnifying his name. And that goes on for eternity. So what God is saying to the Israelites is, look, when you bring an offering, bring your heart. The covenant of salt is connected to the heart. He says, just don't bring an offering and hand it off and walk away. That offering is supposed to be an extension of what you think about me. When you bring a grain offering as a thank offering to me, he says, be thankful. Have a heart of gratitude. That's the covenant of salt. That's what salt means in this context. Remember God says the people serve me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me? That's the point he's trying to get to here. The covenant of salt is a recognition on our part that I am forever grateful for what he has done. I'm forever thankful for his continuing faithfulness to me. And it's an expression of the heart. That's why he says, don't let salt ever be left out of the offering. It's, a, it's an expression of things. Listen to David's side of the covenant. First Chronicles 17. I'm on page 3 if you're trying to follow me. First Chronicles 17, verse 23. This is David's response to God telling him he will build him a house. And now, O Lord, the words which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. So God says to David, I'll establish your house. David says to God, I'll establish your worship. I'll magnify your name forever. So who's the one who penned a lot of the Psalms? David. What do many of the Psalms say? Magnify the Lord. Who's the one who established 24-7 worship of God? David. See, David recognizes God's making a covenant that is permanent with him, and David's responding. He says, God, you have given me promises, and my heart is going to be turned towards you. And on my behalf, I will focus Israel's attitude towards you as well. I will magnify your name forever. The second purpose of salt is it's an element of meals, and therefore it speaks of fellowship. It means that they sat down and ate together, and that's what covenants often were done over. They would sit down and have a meal and then they would make promises to one another. It speaks of friendship. It speaks of love. It speaks of respect. So salt has that connotation as well. It talks about fellowship. In the scriptures, salt is also used as a cleansing agent. In Ezekiel chapter 16, God is speaking over the nation of Israel and he says, As for your nativity... On the day that you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things. And God says, I came along and I saw you and I took you up and I cleansed you and I clothed you. But notice what he's saying. No one took salt and rubbed it on you. You know, when a baby comes out, it's all slimy. And to get all of that stuff cleaned off and to kill off any bacteria that might be in the air, once they got the goo off, they would rub them with salt to absorb the rest of the stuff and to clean them. 
This is what God's talking about. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, Then the men of the city came to Elisha. Please notice the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. And he said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to that day, according to the word of Elijah, which he spoke. So there's two places in the Old Testament where salt is used as cleansing. Now, these things aren't disconnected. The salt of the covenant and the salt of cleansing are not two separate things. They're intertwined. Now, there's one more place in Scripture that's very, very intriguing, and it fits with where we've been. Remember, let me, let me preface this. The Beatitudes are about helping us separate our attachments to the world so that the words of God can begin to influence our lives. So it's detaching from the world and becoming connected to God. And last week we drove home the idea of not being fixed on trying to gather things of the earthly realm, but fixating on the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So let's look at this one. Mark 9, page 4 of the notes. Mark 9, verse 35. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Now just stop there for a second. Many sermons preached on this, but I want you to take notice. The world's attitude is to become prominent, to rise to the top, to occupy the point of the pinnacle, to have servants. In the world's mentality, you're great if you have servants. Jesus is speaking just the contrary, and he says, if you want to be great... You'll be the servant of all. In one statement, he has said, throw out the mentality of the world and adopt a new mentality. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. Now John answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him, because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ... Now, surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Again, notice Jesus is dealing with earthly and kingdom mentalities. Remember when the children were brought to him, the disciples were saying, no, 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 keep them away, they're a bother. And Jesus says, no, let them come. Understand it, two mentalities. The world's mentality was children are a bother until they get big enough to work. But until then, they're just a pest. Jesus says, no. The mentality of the kingdom of heaven is you embrace them. You let them climb on you. You let them spit up on you. It doesn't matter. Because the mentality of the kingdom of heaven is different. It looks at the weakness of people and embraces them and says, I'll help you. I'll carry you. I'll defend you. I'll support you. I'll provide for you. That's the mentality of God's kingdom. And then the disciples are like, hey, we saw people doing work in your name, but they're not tagging along with us. So we told them to knock it off. Jesus says, don't do that. If they're doing stuff in my name, they're not going to turn around and speak evil of me. Tell them, keep at it. <laughs> Encourage their faith. Verse 42, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble... It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. 
Now we're getting into the depth of Jesus' point. Not only are you not to shoo the kids away, but make sure that how you live does not cause them to stumble in a relationship with me. Because if the way that you live affects their faith in me, it would be better if you die before you ever cause that. Jesus is saying, you need to be careful about how you live. And now he begins to make his point. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that should never be quenched, where the worm does not die and fire is not quenched. Now, folks, I want you to pick up on this as we go through it. Jesus is talking about dealing with the physical realm. And he's using this earthly body to make his point. That the spirit man, the spiritual kingdom of God, is more important than anything in the earth, including this earthen vessel. Notice what he just said. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to go through life without a hand than to not know the God and to become a stumbling block for others. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet or to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now again, folks, understand. Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is the launching pad for Jesus to begin to make these comments. Blessed are the persecuted in the earth because their eyes are fixated on the kingdom of heaven. If you can't get your body control, under control, if it causes you to sin, cut it off. Because the spiritual kingdom is much more important. Verse 49. For everyone... <laughs> For everyone will be seasoned or salted with fire. And every sacrifice will be seasoned or salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Jesus is talking here, recorded in Mark, that salt's cleansing effect needs to be on us. Salt needs to be active in my life in cleansing the world from me, but also keeping in close connection the covenant relationship with God. Because salt means both of those things. Salt is to cleanse off the junk of the world. But salt is also my reminder that I have a relationship with God. To magnify his name forever. Everybody with me so far? So Jesus is making a proclamation to these people saying, look. Here's what salt does. The cleansing part of salt, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That's the salt cleansing. But the other part of salt is you have a covenant with God. Don't forget that. And your covenant with God is to magnify his name, to worship him. To declare before the world, he is my God. And I do that by obedience. So the world has to go so that the word of God can take over 
and I walk in obedience to God, manifesting his righteousness. So Jesus is saying to the people, everyone's going to be seasoned or salted with fire, depending on the translation you look up. The word is actually salted. Everyone's going to be salted with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned or salted with salt. He's jumping right back to the Old Testament. He's going right back to Leviticus. And he's saying, look, what I talked about, you giving your grain offering and making sure there's salt in it, I'm taking that reference and I'm applying it to your life. He says it has nothing to do with just making sure that you throw salt on the grain when you give it to God. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, your heart relationship to me must be pure. And the intention of what you do in your relationship with me must be holy. I can't come to God and offer him a gift thinking, okay, but there's something I really want. So if I, God's not to be manipulated. Our worship of God is to be holy. It's to be pure. And in doing this, Jesus is doing an extreme example of separating the physical part of our being from the spirit part of our being. And he's saying the spirit is so important that if your physical being is causing you to stumble, then cut it off. Now, he's not really advocating those things. He's simply making a point that we are to be so focused on the spirit relationship with God that this earthly vessel just does not matter. So notice he goes from being persecuted by somebody else. He goes from someone else afflicting pain on my physical being to me doing it to myself in order to have the right attitude towards him. And if I allow God's words to act as salt in my life and begin to drive out all the impurities of the world, and then the nature of God replaces it, you understand that when I'm persecuted, I'll understand God's point of view. That it's not to seek revenge, but it's to bless the very ones who are persecuting me. So I have to deal with my own attitude about this earthen vessel to really come to a place of maturity. What am I willing to sacrifice from the earthly realm, including this earthly body, for the sake of knowing him and abiding in a covenant with him that's pure and holy? Salt as a cleansing agent is the removal of anything that would interfere with the covenant of salt relationship with God, as well as any impediment that would attempt to disrupt our relationship with him. In Judges chapter 9, won't read through the passage here, but Abimelech is king of Israel, and the town of Shechem, which is within Israel's kingdom, has an issue with Abimelech, and they come to make war with him, so Abimelech goes and makes war with them and wipes them all out. And according to the text, after he destroys the people, he sows the land with salt. But we know what happens if you do that. Nothing's going to grow. And God says, the sin of the people of Shechem is put back on them. Again, it has to do with removing impurities. But listen to this. Paul right into the church at Colossae. On page 5 of the notes, you're trying to follow me, mid-page. Colossians 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be, seized, always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. 
Again, salt comes into this context in two ways. One, make sure that salt is active in your thinking and your speech so that you only say the things God wants you to say. Why? Because by speech and by behavior, we are representing God. Our function is to magnify him. And very quickly, speech can communicate a wrong message about who our God is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, page 5 of the notes. Verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Again, it's very interesting when you put it in here, it's like, but everything's about bread. Well, yeah, but notice what he says. Cast out the leaven and be a new lump. Have relationships with people without malice. I was doing some research. It's like, okay, well, so what's going on here? Because... Paul writes to the Colossians and says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. And yet to the Corinthians, he says, hey, be a new lump. Don't have any leaven. But it turns out that salt counteracts baker's yeast. Again, what does that mean? It means it keeps the leaven from taking place. So again, Paul's just using common language for them that they would understand and saying the same thing. Have salt in yourself to remove impurities, including the words that you would say, in order to be the representation of God. So Jesus goes from blessed are the persecuted to you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That, play, that scripture has always plagued me because it's like, how does salt lose its flavor? Well, when we put it back in its context of what we've just walked through, it makes perfect sense. You are the salt of the earth. What is he saying to them? We are not here to simply make things taste good. As being the salt of the earth, you and I are the representation of the covenant relationship with God. The covenant of salt. You and I function in this earth magnifying God, glorifying him, and communicating to people around us, he is my God, and you know that because I obey him. I am upholding my part of the covenant of salt. And I do it day after day after day after day because the covenant of salt is everlasting. We're also the salt in the earth that as we obey God, therefore his righteousness functions through me. So wherever I'm standing, God's righteousness is driving out the impurities of this space. And that wherever I go in obedience to God, the righteousness of God is driving out impurities. So I'm upholding the covenant of salt relationship while I'm also being the salt that removes impurities from the space I occupy. So how does salt lose its flavor? I begin to embrace the world's ways again. I lose the covenant of salt when I turn my back on God and dismiss the relationship and begin to reattach to the ways of the world. When I let its beliefs and its mannerisms affect and influence my life and behave that way, I have salt that has lost its flavor. I've lost its saltiness. The effectiveness of being the righteousness of God in the earth is gone because I've dismissed the relationship. 
I've broken the covenant of salt with him by reattaching to the world's ways. This is what the writer of Hebrews means. Chapter 6, verse 4, page 6 of the notes. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. The writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you come to God in a covenant relationship of salt. It's permanent. It's to be enduring. It's to go day after day after day for the rest of your life. But if you dismiss that relationship and you re-embrace the world and simply adopt its ways again and begin to function that way, there's no hope for you. You are salt that has lost its saltiness. You become a misrepresentation of who God is. It's as if you have taken Jesus and put him back on the cross again. And he says, for that, there is no sacrifice. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, Samuel is dealing with Saul. Saul has been disobedient to what the Lord God said to him. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. So here Samuel is saying to Saul, you have violated what God told you to do. And you're claiming that you disobeyed so that you would have all of this stuff to make sacrifices. But folks, this goes back to the beginning of the message. Putting salt in the grain offering is not simply the act of putting salt in the offering. Putting salt in the offering is an extension and a communication of my heart relationship to God. I am grateful for what he has done for me, and I will magnify his name forever before all people that he is my God, and the reason I have grain is because he delivered it to me. The reason I have it is because he's been faithful to his word. And Samuel is saying to Saul, God doesn't care about the offerings. What he cares about is the condition of your heart. Because that's what the salt in the offering means. And he's saying to Saul, God doesn't need the offerings. He doesn't need the sacrifices. What he wants is your obedience. Because your obedience communicates his lordship. Your obedience communicates he is your God. Your obedience communicates that you're magnifying his name above all names. And you've dismissed all of that. So what happens? God says... Your kingship doesn't go on forever. And he picks a new man who has the heart after God's heart. One more, Hebrews 10, verse 35. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while... And yet he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate to these believers, first of all, the text, the context of Hebrews is, you're immature, you need to be maturing. And in the midst of that text, he at least says to them two times, actually several more, he warns them about not maturing. He warns them about drifting away from God. He talks about enduring to the end. The just shall live by faith in God. Anyone who draws back, what's he talking about? Anyone who returns to putting their faith in the world system. God says, I'm, I have no pleasure in the one who turns away from me.
when Jesus says to these people, you are the salt of the earth. He's communicating to them, coming out of the Old Testament, about a relationship with him. And he's saying to them, you are vessels in the earth, ambassadors of God, representations of his righteousness. To communicate to the world, one, your relationship with him. And invite them to that same relationship. He's using language that's very, very powerful in what that actually means. Remember, Jesus is walking into the kingdom of darkness, bringing words of liberation. And he's trying to help them understand that as you begin to come out of, this, out of the kingdom of darkness, your attitude towards God must be continuing to develop and develop and develop. It's putting salt in the offering. Your heart attitude must always be connected to God. Do not return to loving the world. It's dangerous, dangerous territory. Everybody okay? I confuse you? you stand with me this morning? Almighty God, I pray that, Lord, your spirit would watch over these words as they speak to the hearts of people. Lord God, where my communication has failed, bring clarity, I pray, to each one to see, Lord, what it is that you're actually saying, to see the meaning of these terms, how you're using them and what you're trying to say to us. Lord, draw us ever closer to you. Um, and Lord, help us to see that the commitment, the covenant is for eternity. And that you're calling us to live that way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.